The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Sunday, 3rd of May. The Fuji Cast. Did Alps have a good birthday? Amazing. Good. Did he, did he drink Did he drink all the champagne? No, I did. <laughs> I said I'd tell him what it was like. Yeah. Uh, you, you'll get there soon enough. He didn't want to wish his life away just so he can have a glass of pop. Um, yeah, to- young Thomas, uh, uh, you know, who's the same age as, as Albie. Well, he won't be in a couple of weeks' time, or um, well, no, no, a couple of months' time. He's going to hit his tenth birthday. Is um, is is our Thomas? But he's saying, I just want to. We we put an arbitrary figure on this. He said, I just want to be thirteen so I can have an eye watch. <laughs> it was the age that we said when you, you're when you're thirteen, you'll be old enough for an eye watch. Don't know where it is. Came that what from. they call it? An eye watch? Yeah. Isn't it called an Apple Watch? Oh, it's an Apple Watch. I've always called it an iWatch. Is it an Apple Watch? I suppose it is. It's an Apple Watch, isn't it? You're absolutely right. Well, technically, then, he could ask for one sooner than when he's 13. I don't want an iWatch, Dad. I want an Apple Watch. Can I have that when I'm 11? <laughs> anyway, welcome to the Fuji Cast, the photography show that's gone daily during the uh, during the lockdown. Um, it's usually weekly. Yes, it's called the Fuji Cast, but all, all flavours, um, all genres, very very welcome. Um, and and as for lockdown, Kev, it does there there do seem to be some green shoots of hope, don't there? Uh, I people, was just thinking that actually. Thinking, I reckon yeah. this week coming. I reckon this week coming, they're going to allow. People, some people back, you know, like uh, to where? small small offices or something like that, who can mm. sit three meters apart, and that that would include us. Well, I'm already in it. <laughs> yeah, but I could get in my car and drive to you. In oh, which you case, could. What yeah, do we do then? Yeah, do we yeah. stop? To, do yeah. we stop being daily? The moment I can come to you. The moment you step through this door, <laughs> I have to answer it. Of course, is that Kev? If it's Kev, <laughs> I'm pretending I'm not here, so the dailies can continue. <laughs> Kids, duck down underneath the window. Make out you've gone out. Yeah, but in serious, so in seriousness, yeah. this could be the last week of dailies. You never know. I, I was, I, I've got an inkling that things yes. like that might happen. Yeah, well, the moment, yeah, that's true. The moment, yeah, we always said that that the dailies. I don't think they're going to be doing weddings and stuff anytime soon. But no. I think, I think the you know the very small gatherings. Could so, be... so would would you would you carry on doing? Uh, so I, I'll put this as a choice. Okay, multiple choice with only two choices. <laughs> Would you rather carry on doing the uh, the daily from your office into my office, or from Malmesbury into near Newbury, or would you rather do it once a week and come over so you can actually drink my coffee and steal my pens? Uh, <laughs> well, as much as the daily has been great, yes, uh, we have got a lot of work. I, I, I reckon. I reckon we need to, even if they say this week, yeah, you know, you're allowed to go back to it. Yes, I think we should aim to do. F- how many have we done? I think we should aim to do. We should definitely make sure we hit fifty. Fifty, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but of course, if they say if they don't do that, we'll just have to carry on. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, some people are are going back to uh, to to work here and there, aren't they? Um, it it depends what kind of industry you work in, though, isn't it? It's funny. I said to Gemma yeah, on Friday when um, or Thursday was it? I can't remember when um, when Boris said we are over the peak. Yes. I said to Gemma, that's the yeah, first yeah. time they've used that language. Is it? And I said, you watch now, you watch. There will be cars, there will be people. And I'm looking at my window now. And, uh, you know, of, of course, it's the weekend, but it's there's a lot more cars. There's a lot more people. Um, you know, people have, have got that sense of, well, he said, we're over the peak. And they're wrong. Mm. They're absolutely wrong. Everyone that goes by, I'm raising my very substantial eyebrows at them. <laughs> but they, um, you know, they're, they're going by now. You can probably yeah. hear the cars. There's four of them have just gone by. Yeah. So it's it's very tentative steps, isn't it? Very yeah. tentative. And, and rightly so. Absolutely rightly mm. so. Right. Question. Then we've got today's star interview. Um, Janice CL in Australia. <laughs> I've been using the Fujifilm X-T10 camera for the last few years and recently decided to pursue day-in-the-life documentary photography. I came across Kevin's day-in-the-life work a year or so ago. I couldn't get it out of my head. So I decided I wanted to try that out. I completed a portfolio shoot with a friend's family and created uh, an e-photo book as part of that. Question I have for you is if you were providing advice to somebody starting out in the day-in-the-life family photography uh, sessions, how would you suggest I go about building my portfolio 
portfolio and pricing. There are a couple of questions as to this. So let's start there first of all. How do you suggest you go about building the portfolio? I mean, you've just got to get in somebody's house and start taking out their pictures, yeah. which is difficult yeah. at the moment. But getting easier in Australia, funnily enough, since we're talking about lockdown getting easier. Uh, yes, obviously you need, to, you need a portfolio. And, and the good thing about doing the life stuff is you can practice on anybody. Yeah. Um, it's not like a wedding where it has to be a wedding. That's far more difficult. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, friends, family, yourself, your, your, if you've got your own kids. I mean, most of my, my day in the life stuff, uh, the embryonic days were pictures of my kids, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, all of that stuff is – it's very easy to get the portfolio. You need to – you need to make sure that whoever you're asking to be your guinea pigs, if you like, are on board with your style. That's the, that's the key thing. Mm. So there's no point saying to your next door neighbor, you know what, I'm going to be doing these uh, photos. I need to do some. Uh, it'll be totally free, but I want to come and practice on you and put them on my website and everything. Are you okay with that? And then you turn up and they're in their Sunday best and expecting you to take, you know, yeah. classic portraits in the yeah. living room. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's what you're trying to do, of course. But if you're not, day in the life doesn't really lend itself to that. Then you need to make sure that they understand that. And yeah. the difficulty yeah. will be 100% percent the husband or the males the males in the house why because they don't like it they don't typically do not understand and do not unless they're photographers or they, they you know they've got an, an understanding of it they think when they've got a stranger in the house taking pictures they, it's they've got to breathe in they've got to you know make sure that they're they're, they're stood up straight and all yeah, that kind of stuff yeah and really the best day in the life stuff is when you're when they're in their pajamas or they spill coffee down themselves or they're you know they're having a bit of a barney with the kids or whatever that's that's what makes the the best pictures mm. um so make sure that whoever it is you're you're going to be doing your um uh guinea pigging on guinea pigging yeah, well, pig we know what you mean your, your, <laughs> uh, on your, board test, with your style your test yeah and, and that's true because i i've not done many day in the lives um but it did take a i, I worked obviously with we've talked about this before with one of your clients really mm. lovely clients um she's a photographer totally gets it but it took me a little while to to just get the husband to understand my presence there. What constitutes day in the life, Kev? Because you're not necessarily there. I was there on one of the occasions all day, so from the morning right through to bedtime. But on the other time, I was there only for about three hours. Yeah. So yeah, I call it day in the life, and then I give them options for three hours, six hours, or or dawn till dusk. Right. Um, so yeah i mean day in the life is the brand name if you like and uh or the colloquial name for it but yeah i mean technically day in the life is a day you know you're there when they wake up and you're there when they go to bed and um uh kirsten lewis in the united states oh, she's who, good at it. yeah yeah who uh and i will of course uh link to her details on our new super shiny podcast notes on the website yep yep she is um she's pretty vocal about this she's pretty vocal about most things in fairness to her um but she you know a day in the life is a day in the life you must be there you go when i do a day in the life i will <laughs> go the night before and i'll sleep in their house and i'll make sure i'm up before they are and i'll make sure i go to bed be after they do yeah and uh in fairness she's built a very very yeah. good business on yeah. that mentality and her pictures really are yeah. oh, phenomenal yeah. Do you think it makes a difference that um, Kirsten is female and uh, we're two great hairy oiks? Yes, I do. I do think that. And um, I think you, uh, as a female, you will have a, a greater chance of being accepted into somebody's house, especially if there's young children. I think that's wrong, but it's the fact. Yeah. And uh, yes, so I find it difficult. I don't, I don't get that many um, bookings these days or inquiries. Yeah. I, I get lots of emails from other photographers saying, know, I yeah. saw your day in the life stuff when I, I, you know, I love it. I love it. I love it. And I'm, I'm going to go off and do it a little bit like this, this email here, I suppose. Um, and they're nearly always from females. Yeah. Nearly always from females. I know starting uh, pricing for, for this kind of photography will be different in different countries and markets. But what are day in the life photographers charging if they're new to the genre versus season? photographers i think that is a bit of a how long's a piece of string question really isn't it yeah and i've got my stock answer to these kinds of questions these yeah. days and, and that's basically it's impossible to give you a figure but what you must always do is treat it as business so yes. Yes. Uh, imagine just imagine you didn't have any other income All what right. would you uh, need to charge good advice and um thank you janice from australia all right so it's time for today's interview sunday photography guest is Stuart bingham who is a commercial photographer in the northwest of England. For decades, he's worked successfully in this field in a number of sub-genres, which we'll discuss. In terms of marketing, 
He may be surprised to learn that somebody so successful in his line of business has relied upon more traditional methods of uh, finding work and filling his diary. Where some send an email, Stuart picks up a phone or organises targeted direct mail postage style. His breadth of subject matter is what's kept him busy. And that's because for him, there's a kind of tentacle level approach. Shooting product for a client can lead to head shop work, which leads to company reports, which leads to commercial property and then an event and and uh, well you get the picture so here's Stuart talking about his commercial work and if you're in a genre wondering how other genres may be good to investigate coming out of this then you can't do much better than to listen to somebody who's not only bought and wears the t-shirt but has probably shot the thing too and as a bonus in radio and telly they often say when you finished an interview don't stop rolling now, just for Stuart's sake, because I don't want you to now panic as you're listening to this, Stuart, the stuff we shared about photographing VIPs and the strange habits they have, while fascinating for a, a bar-side chat one day, is safely on the cutting room floor, as they used to call it in direct mail language. But what is interesting, and for those who shoot mirrorless, and in particular Fujifilm, Stuart shoots this breadth of work on a limited number of lenses and a camera body that's been with him for a while. He's a man acutely aware of budget and cameras earning a place within a company's purse rather than burning a hole through a photographer's pocket. And we finished the interview, which I'd been expecting to conduct about business side only, to be reminded that actually it doesn't do any harm to sometimes say, what kit do you shoot with? Because as you'll find out in the bonus part, uh, you can shoot this variety of work without having to take out huge loans for kit. Start and build but shoot while you're doing that successfully without debt. So, here's Stuart Bingham. So, first and most important question, Stuart. On this show, we talk a lot about social photography, the the, the lighter stuff like portraiture, weddings, that kind of thing. We know, we know how that's affected that market or how this thing has affected that market. How, how has um, COVID-19 affected commercial photography and everything that you do? Uh, everything, well, it shut it down completely, really. You know, the odd businesses that are still running are short-staffed. They're working on keeping their businesses running, getting themselves ready for, for the unlock. And um, so, yeah, nobody really wants you around as a commercial photographer. You know, it's just time for getting on with other stuff. Such, such as what? Accounts and all that kind of interesting? Uh, accounts, websites. I've just spent a couple of weeks rebuilding websites. Okay. I, I run two websites, one for property photography and one straight for commercial. Uh, the property websites have uh, been ranking well for quite a while the commercial website disturbing me and I, I knew this i've just been ignoring it for an awfully long time has never ranked at all i've you know done an ordinary search for it and gone through 40 pages of google and can't find it so a cu- couple of weeks of hard grafters i've got that commercial site onto page two of google so, you know and that takes a lot of work and it's and that- just the sort, of, the sort of stuff you ignore when you're when you've got yeah. paid clients coming in. That's intriguing that you say that it, it's, it's, it was so far down in the ranking because you're very well respected as a commercial photographer. Your business is going very, very well. So I'd noticed, though, you... you and has, has the... Because I've obviously looked at your site in the, the last week and a bit while I've been preparing to talk to you. Has, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more uh, text on there than most commercial photographers. Has that been part of the process of you upranking the site, as it were? I think if you're lacking text, you're, you're lacking information that Google can use to, to rank you. Pictures really don't help with, with, with a Google search. Mm. And, you know, no matter how good your pictures are, Google doesn't know. Um, so you, you've got to have the rest of the back end of the website working. And when you're writing your website it, or we're writing web pages, as much as writing for clients to understand what you're doing, you're writing so that Google understands what you do. We talk a lot about that, actually, because because Kev, obviously, uh, my, my co-host, has got an SEO background. So he's always saying to me, Neil, don't write for Google write for human beings and you do write for i know you're just saying that you you write for google as well but but actually a lot of what you what you write is very eloquent and it's it's written certainly for humans to devour isn't it Stuart? yeah i've, I've, I've used various seo plugins and, and some of those um can be a nightmare to use because they want you to write for google they moan mm. about keyword density and you know uh, page length and all this sort of stuff i, I think google's very good at understanding from you know, from plain English, what you mean, uh, you know, and what you're up to. And the ultimate end of the, uh, the ultimate purpose for this is that you're 
clients will read it. Your clients don't understand. If you get you know, into complex, complex stuff about photography, then th- mm-hmm. they're not going to understand that and they don't really care. They want to know how you can help them. So you've got to write enough information that they can glean uh, from the site that you can help solve a problem for them. I'm, I'm always very intrigued as to why people choose the genres that they choose, why people become fashion or wedding or, or portrait or, in your case, commercial, which is a very wide remit as well in, in, in the work that you present on, on your website. And the links will be in the show notes. How, how did you... How did you choose commercial photography, Stuart, or, or did it choose you? I think it chose me. I, I don't have the constitution for um, f- for weddings. Uh, I initially trained, you know, in the eighties as, as a scientific photographer. Mm. Uh, worked in uh, as a medical photographer for three years, and then did three years in engineering with the MOD, and then completely changed tack and did twenty years in, in a press office. Uh, and what, so I have a very technical background, but the press office teaches you, you know, it teaches you people skills. It teaches you about communication, producing photographs that. Mm. That, that communicate something to people that, that that people engage with. So I think that that sort of fusion of, of 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 communication and technical background, I think, lends itself quite well to commercial photography. So break it down for me, Stuart, because it's it's a wide remit. You can see that by your website. Anything that a business needs to, to support its business. So it's about business marketing and and selling products or services. Um, that can be on their website in, in their um, printed material on advertising. Although advertising is 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 a very specialist field in its in itself, so for where I live in Cheshire, it's, it's dealing with the businesses who need to to improve their marketing. So we're not talking about high end London advertising. We're talking about businesses in the northwest that need to improve you know, improve their performance. So it's working with them to understand what they do and, and you know what their next step is and where they want to what they want to achieve. And discussing with them where they want to be after that and breaking that down to, to transition them from photography not being very good to move it on to something better and then hopefully keep that going as, as, the, as they make the improvements. It's, it's staff portraits, yeah. uh, product shots, uh, working shots from, from you know, around their business, pictures in the factories or on production lines, yeah. you know, whatever it is their business does. How does that uh, relationship start then, Stuart? Because I mean, you were saying to me just a moment ago that you you don't you weren't necessarily ranking high as as, as a Google business, as it were, but you have been bringing in, in the work. You can see that by the, by the amount of of work that you've done. Uh, so people are clearly coming to you. Is that word of mouth, or is that you cold calling, or is, how does how does that part of the commercial business work? Um, I've, I've, I've I found very little work off in you know, social media. Everybody tells you you've got to do social media, and that's something I'm now going to start exploring during lockdown but i i found word of mouth and direct mail is 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 the most productive mm. um sending emails as as you know borderline gets you into trouble if when you're sending unsolicited emails so i've, I've cut all kind of, all email marketing has gone yeah. so it's getting out there and meeting people um word of mouth and direct mail nobody really complains about something coming in the mail and i think you get more attention from someone when, when they've got a nice thing drops on their you know in, the, in their in tray and if they open the envelope and they kind of like what they see they might not have time to read it now but they'll just throw it to the end of the desk and it, and it comes back again you send them an email and they, they'll delete it without reading it who are you aiming at then because if you're if you're direct mailing and it's fascinating to hear people still using direct mail because i mean i get a lot of direct mail and it's always interesting to talk to people who have a different opinion to somebody else who says oh no it's email now who sends direct mail anymore and you're a perfect example of somebody who does and thrives through it who are you, who are you generally sort of reaching out to when you when you direct mail my, my direct mail campaigns of, of uh, you know the mass of businesses around here, you know, small businesses, they're really hard to direct mail because you need to know something about them before you before you stick something in the post. Yeah. Otherwise, they get meaningless nonsense. So my direct mail campaigns have been uh, aimed at estate agents and schools and colleges. Right. And currently, all the clients I have with you know, with a long term relationship, uh, you know, regardless of the amount of business that I get from them, some are bigger than others, but all those long term relationships have all been built from direct mail. Now, the gatekeepers, of course, are the, the people you need to get past, aren't they? You need to do your research. You need to be looking at the, you know, don't just look at the website and look for the list of contacts. You need to be uh, looking at their their news pages, um, look what's appeared in the local press, you know, track them down wherever you can and try and find out who the contacts are for their PR work or, or you know, uh, just narrow it down as much as you can. You can go straight into the principal uh, with a school or a college, but they're liable to just throw it in the bin. 
or they might go and throw it on whoever's in charge of marketing. But the marketing, they could have a marketing department with a marketing officer. And, and these days with larger academies and larger schools, I, I, the, many of them probably do have PR departments, don't they? The, the, you mentioned social media just a moment ago. The world has changed quite a bit over the last decade in terms of how pictures are actually now consumed and used. How much of your work is now social media focused? Not necessarily you using social media, but producing work that others can use on social media. Very little, almost almost nothing I do is 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 directly aimed at social media. The stuff I produce for other aspects of the business will appear on social media, but I don't generally produce stuff that's purely aimed at a, at a social media platform. Hmm. Um, which makes sense if you think about it, because if you produce, if you're going to the expense of getting a professional photographer in, who's who's going to want to know about your business going to have, want to build a relationship with you in order to produce decent photographs so there's a time commitment to this as well as a as a cost commitment so doing that just for a social media post that's going to be you know chip wrappings in three days time it seems a bit of a waste and, and i would advise clients that that's a bit of a waste if you've got me in let's produce you know we can produce a lot more for, for no additional cost so what you're planning for your social media campaign you can use it in a, in a college prospectus you can use it in press releases uh, you can use it on posters you can use it wherever you want so let's produce a product that has a lifespan rather than just appearing on social media and then being gone now we could talk at length on any one of the 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 genres of your business property or product or commercial schools portraits pr events they would be individual interviews in themselves so i'm gonna i'm gonna break down each of those and just ask a couple of questions about each of that's okay and we're gonna start with product years ago Stuart, i did a lot of work for a company called high and mighty and they they would appear once a month they'd bring huge boxes loads of t-shirts and shirts and trousers or pants as you'd call it in the states and jackets you name it Stuart. we'd lay them all out on the floor and we'd shoot from above and if i were to be honest it drove me insane <laughs> What what are the but now you have made um, you, you're an expert in shooting product in the studio. Um, what are the essentials to it? What skills does a photographer need to to have to be able to do it? I think before you get to the skills, you need to to, to understand why your client is doing it. Mm. You know what are those product photographs for? Um, and I think the vast majority of, of product stuff I do is white background e commerce type work. Um, and then added to that, you'll get a few hero shots for websites, you know, a few location shots of products. Um, but I kind of consider those to be, you know, standard marketing PR rather than um, product shots. So mm. the product shots, I really categorize as the, as the white background stuff. And I think my technical background, you know, I I'd spent a lot of time as a student in a, in a studio with a 5.4 camera messing around with glass top tables and you know, <laughs> studio lights and <laughs> trying to get sort of scientific shots. And I kind of take the same approach to product photography. I don't use a white tent. Uh, I don't own a white tent. I wouldn't touch one with a barge pole. Everything that goes in the front of the camera gets lit individually. So when those when that box of products arrives, I break them down, put them into categories. So you know, in, in categories in terms of how they'll be lit. So I'm moving the lights as little as possible. Then I light one batch, get all the lights right, roll the stuff through and, and photograph it, and then uh, move on to the next batch. So some might be, you know, jackets flat on the floor. Um, the next product from the firm might be a complex shape out of shiny metal, which can mm. take forever to shoot. How much of your time is spent in post-production? Or, or, or are you going to say to me, no, Neil, get it right in camera first, and you will spend limited amount of time in front of a computer? Uh, the white backgrounds can be a nightmare. Uh, so it depends on the product. Sometimes I might shoot on black and, and then clip it to white. Mostly I shoot on white, but it depends how the reflections are going to lie. Um, so you've got to be putting the black flags and stuff in you know, uh, in the studio to get the thing lit properly. In the old days on film, you would spend forever trying to balance the white background off to get the shadow right and you know the illuminated from underneath. It's probably 50-50, you know? Mm. If I'm going to spend four hours in the studio, um, I can guess that's probably going to be four hours sat at the Mac. Do you know, one of, one of the experiences I, I had through product work many moons ago, some of the work I did simply went in-house, with no pun intended. Um, you hear this about the real estate market as well, where agents have bought their own drones or 360 setups and have swapped the superior work like your own work for a kind of, well, that'll do kind of approach with their, their own kit. 
Has this affected the studio work and product work that you do as well? Do people value it properly? The clients I get, yes, but I think they value it properly before they pick up the phone. Uh, but you are right. Most people now, they, they, you know, they look at the standard of photography on eBay and that's what they're trying to produce. You know, I've got one client uh, who produces pet products. Uh, their quality of work was 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 dire shot in the warehouse with a phone but they got in a marketing firm to re- redo their website the marketing firm contracted me to to produce decent photography for the website so i think once you've once you've converted the client to to professional product photography it's really really difficult for them to go back well we were talking about real estate a moment ago and uh, we did a whole special on that last weekend it's a it's another wing or arm of your own business as well Stuart. i, I would say now that's the mainstay of my business that's Absolutely. that's kind of what keeps me afloat but it's more than just selling new houses isn't it i mean you're into the letting world you're you, it's multifaceted isn't it uh, yeah for me it doesn't matter what what's happening to the to the to the property, it doesn't matter whether it's an office block or a you know a one bedroom flat. It doesn't matter what it is. It's it's a building. You know, if you if you talk to photojournalists, they'll tell you it's about you know your work is about telling the story, mm. and that's essentially the same for every for for any photograph you tell. You you, you produce you're telling the story, and I think that's particularly impro- important in the property market. If somebody's looking at buying a house or renting a, an office block or you know, looking for student accommodation, whatever it is they're looking for, what they're trying to work out is. Can I live in that property? Is that property going to suit my personal needs? So what you're trying to do is tell the story of that house, you know, work out how people move around it, how they live in it, and, and photograph that house so that somebody can look at that and say, that's brilliant, you know, I can live in that. People are looking for their future lifestyle, for their dreams, for, you know, for what, what things are going to be in, you know, the next year, 10 years. Um, you're selling them a dream. Uh, and and if, you, if, you, if you don't communicate that as a story of, of what they can achieve out of what you're offering in terms of that property, then why should they come and look at it? We're going to leap to schools, <laughs> yep. which, which brings about the image of hundreds of students posing for the biannual portrait for many. But yours isn't. Yours is a lifestyle approach. Did you work in the portrait side as well, or, or, or was it always a storytelling approach for things like the school prospectus that interested you? Uh, it's school prospectus that interests me. It's one of the first things I got into when I went self-employed, and it, it's something that lends itself very well to having been a, uh, you know, press office photographer. As a press office photographer, you're producing, you know, photojournalism stuff. Mm. Um, you know, obviously from a different, pers- you know, from a different approach, but a different perspective. But it's still, it's still press work. Am I overcomplicating it? But I, I would imagine it must bring uh, enormous sort of challenges with regard permissions because you you work with children. It does, but there are, there are ways of doing that. I have separate terms and conditions for schools and colleges, which clearly lays out it's up to them to obtain permissions. Um, and that, ob- you know, the permission to photograph children may not necessarily be permission for them to use it on their uh, on their marketing material. So it's up to the schools and colleges to make sure that the thing that the parents tick to say that the kids can be photographed highlights to the parents the, the range of materials that those pictures can be used on. So that's um, that's looked after before you before you start, really. Yes, the, the the schools and colleges are aware. I don't want any children taken out of classes. I don't want children that are you know removed from the from the room when I walk in. I, when I walk in, I I expect to be told if there are any children in this room, mm. and I'll be quietly told, you know, the, um, the blonde girl at the back in the purple shirt can't photograph her, and we just stay away from her. Um, events, events, and portraits. I'm I'm, I'm left with. Um, Events is another genre I've worked in just a little bit, so I don't have the experience that you've got by any means, Stuart. I struggle a little bit with events because, um, unlike you, where where you don't fancy the weddings, I quite like the weddings because they have a a much clearer story to me, a much clearer narrative, um, subplots as well. And you're documenting an event, though. What are you looking for? Because you're a storyteller, and and I don't always see the story in an event, but you do. If someone books you to photograph an event, you know, I did some work for Cheshire East at some large events where they were doing presentations to businesses. So they book you to photograph the presentations. And so the, so what you're, ex- what, I think what they're probably expecting to see is the speakers on stage. That's what they booked you for. But that's not the event, is it? That's a, that's a thing within an event. The event for me is to get there before all the attendees arrive, find out what's going off, yeah. find, you know, get a rough timetable of what's happening and, and get some understanding of the event and then photograph the, 
them drinking tea and coffee, photograph all the chatting beforehand, photograph the arrivals, photograph the audience, photograph the speakers, you know, just everything that happens in front of you. It's kind of, the, it's the bit of wedding photography that I can do quite well. What the, the bits of wedding photography I struggle with is, is, is all that list of post photographs, you know, bride and groom, bride and groom with, with bridesmaids, with bride's mum and dad with mum's with the wife's mum and dad I, I struggle with all that and organizing all that well, that's interesting because actually you do say within the website you're not the kind of event photographer who produces pictures and sells them on the night i think there's a massive cost for that and it changes what you do because if, if you're photographing your pictures to sell on the night that's an entirely different thing yeah that's getting photographs of individuals that that individual is going to like mm. Uh, and then you've got to have somebody on site who's got the printer running and is, is, you know, is printing the stuff off as you go. It's a wholly different thing. Um, photographing for the, for the event organiser, it's commercial work. You're producing stuff for the event organiser that they can use to market that, to, to, to report on that event and market future events. It occurs to me, and this is probably the beauty of commercial photography, that, that you, you may well get clients that jigsaw in in respect of if they have one task for you they may just have something else they need you to do as well to, to all these these categories that you see on the website they they, they all link across um single businesses mm. so you know I, I did a lot of work for cheshire's business development company um so that was producing business profiles for you know they would work with a business to to improve whatever aspect of their business needs improving i would work with with cheshire east to produce uh, reports on those businesses for marketing material for uh, internal reports within the council that would occasion that would then bring in some product photography because the, the company needs some product photography doing and you suck up a bit of work from there cheshire east would then be running uh, event work to communicate with 50 businesses all in one go. That would lead to headshot photography of producing, you know, 80 photographs of new councillors on election night. So, so I, I, I kind of don't go out just looking for event work. Right. It's, it's, it's for the clients I get. They need a whole range of work covering and I think they need to understand that once they hired you as a photographer, you can sort the whole thing out for them. It's tentacles, isn't it? Because I can see now how headshot work and portraits feed out of something else, or indeed feed into something else. Yeah, if you're doing, if you're doing, you know, working with a business at some stage, you know, they're almost certainly going to say to you, "You end up doing their product photography," and then at some stage, they're only going to say, "Well, you know, we do, this is all gone on our website, and now we need, you know, mm. we need our us page, so we need these staff portraits doing." I think when you said tentacles, I think you're right. You know, you don't know when you approach a business where those tentacles are going to go. You don't know how they're, how they're organising things. Mm. So, you know, you might end up doing that whole range of stuff, you know, everything that's on that homepage. You might end up doing all of that for a business. You might end up doing two or three of those aspects for a particular business. You know, it's individual for every business, and I don't think mm. when you walk, first walk through the door, you've got any idea where it's going to go. Yeah. And that's probably a good thing. You know, I think if you walk through the door and you know where this is going to go, or you, you've got it predetermined in your head what these people need, then you're probably going to do a bad job. With so many different skills attached to the way that you work, uh, and it being so varied, do, do you think this is going to be the strongest advantage that you have personally when you're emerging from this lockdown? Uh, that's a tough question. Um you know, professionally, I hear so much noise about you need to specialise, you know, pick an area. And uh, and there are lots of businesses out there that purely specialise. You know, just just do a quick Google search and you'll find lots of companies who don't do anything other than product photography yeah. based in their studios and that's all they do. So I think it swings and roundabouts. I don't think there's any way of knowing. I think it's just as a photographer, you play, you play it day by day, you know, you take the breaks as they come. Uh. I think for me here now, that variety of work, um, and that breadth of, of skill is is paying for me. It, it works for me. I, I wouldn't venture to say that that's that's something that everybody can benefit from. You know, for for any individual specialising, may be the way ahead. It may be that you you just want to specialise on doing school and college photography, or you only do headshots. I've got a friend down in London who only does headshots now, and he's stunningly good at them stunningly good and that's what he does you know he doesn't bother with any of the other stuff and if that's if that's paying the bills and that's keeping the work coming in and it's you know it's keeping your brain from from frying then that's brilliant so it's also for courses everybody needs to to plow their own furrow through this business Stuart on the business of shooting commercial now here's the bonus part then we talked about the day-to-day -day in terms of the commercial world then over a coffee we spent a few minutes talking kit 
and he revealed that a previous Gen XT model is still, as they say in the UK, cutting the mustard. Uh, my XT2 is my mainstay for handheld work, for um, events, portraits, that kind of stuff. All oh, right, so you've, you've not gone to XT3 or... Well, I'll change the XT2 when it doesn't do what I need it to do, yeah. which probably means when it dies. Yeah. In business, it's cost control, you know, don't go buying cameras you don't need, that's, right. that's profit gone. Yeah. You know, you've gone by an XT3 when you don't need it, because it's the latest camera. You know, that could be a mortgage payment down the window. Yeah, that went back to service, for service, because that was I bought that to do property work. Bought an X-T20. Now the X-T20 sits on the camera, and that's taking the beating of the daily work, because the image quality is the same, so I might as well kill the cheap one. I started out with a 10 to 24. Yeah, yeah, I've got that lens. Perfect. Wonderful. All-rounder for everything, including filming. I bloody hate it. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to say that. <laughs> I don't know why, but it gives me, uh, down one side, it gives yeah. me a fuzzy edge. I've tried all sorts, and it's not all the time. And right. I cannot I cannot make it do it. It just does it of its own free will. I'm going to go look down the side of all my pictures now. I can't say it's something I've seen. When I was shooting houses with it, everything inside was perfect. I'd go outside and I'd stick it on a tall pole or something, and I'd get, I'd get a fuzzy edge. Right. I, I still, to this day, do not know why. So, what are you so, shooting for for the wide angles in your properties? Then you're not using if you're not using ten twenty four. I have an eight to sixteen two point eight. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the best bit of glass I've ever had my I've ever laid my hands on. It is just stunning. Mm. You know, if somebody wanted to know what you know what equipment they needed to shoot photography, I would tell you the only thing you need is a is a Fuji eight to sixteen. What you put on the back of it is irrelevant. Right. Um, get that Fuji 8 to 16. It is pin sharp for everything. Just, I, I, I cannot praise that, that, that lens enough. Oh. The other thing about the Fujis that I found out when I was looking at them is that the, um, the distortion correction that uh, Lightroom picks up comes out of the lens and is embedded in the raw frame. Whereas with Nikon, that correction is built into Lightroom. So with my Nikon uh, 14 to whatever it was, I'd spent a lot of time correcting barrel distortion because it, Lightroom only corrected the barrel automatically at one focal length. You changed the zoom, the barrel distortion changed. So you couldn't even create a preset because if you just tweaked the, the lens a little bit, then the barrel distortion changed. Um, since going to Fuji, I, and I rarely, rarely ever t- touch barrel distortion anymore. Isn't that interesting? But you're not obviously using the, um, the this wide-angle lens for all your work, clearly, and, and stuff like um, portraits, I, w- I would imagine. You're shooting, what, 56 or, or, or 50 to 140? Or? Um, see, you're getting into stuff I can't answer. <laughs> Stuart, you, <laughs> look, in that, look in that bag. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got an, an 18 to 55. Right, which I've got. That's a great lens. That's a great lens. I, I was stunned how good that is for how cheap it was. Yeah, me too, yeah. And I have, it says going back in the bag, uh, the 50 to 140. 50 to 140, yeah, yeah. Um, That's which a... you get the expensive one with the aperture ring. Yeah. I do, yeah. do a, a lot of portrait work on that. I would imagine that stays on your camera all the time when you're eventing, surely. Uh, yes. Uh, I, you know, I'll have the two, I have two cameras stuck around my neck. The X-T2 gets the 18 to, uh, gets the 50 to 140. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that, that stays on all day. And then the uh, X-T20 will be <coughs> flipping between the 1024 and the 18 to 55. Because the 1024, when I'm doing events, doesn't give me that fuzzy edge. It's when I'm doing houses, it gives me that fuzzy edge. It just picks on you for the housing work, clearly. It picks on me for the housing yeah, work. No, it's got know. personality. <laughs> you know, I don't like equipment with personality. <laughs> you, you found one. It's, you got a haunted, yeah. you got a haunted lens. <laughs> yeah. My thanks to Stuart Bingham for talking commercial and, of course, Kit. And if you'd like to understand more about his work, uh, read as well as enjoy the pictures on his website. And I use those words with a purpose because you'll understand how to write for a site when it's commercial. See, I'd always thought um, it's common sense when writing about weddings, perhaps, yeah, because you have such a unique event with a very identifiable story. But what do you write when you shoot property or, or pots and pans and headshots and events? And to, anyway, to, to link with his site and everything else we've talked about today, go to the new website, all the W's, fujicast.co.uk, which has so much more resource levels than ever before. Right, that's it for Sunday. Back then tomorrow. We are back, aren't we? It, it doesn't even matter if Boris said, look, Kevin, Kevin Mullins is allowed out now. Officially, uh, nobody else in the UK, but Kevin Mullins, we'd, st- we, we'd still be, be wanting to get to 50, wouldn't we? 50. Yeah, we'll do 50. I really loved his little um, video message to Colonel 
called Tom, by the way. Oh yes, yes, yeah. I doesn't... think, yeah. regardless of your political stance, yeah, I think he uh, he sat down behind a table and yeah. you know really he really meant it. I think, and that was nice. I know. Do you know what? I looked at his eyes because I was thinking, oh, are you reading this off Auto Q? Because actually, Boris is very good with Auto Q. Uh, but you can tell when he's reading, and I didn't think I could tell that he was reading that. He's very, he's, he's very, uh, he's very good at delivering that kind of message. I think, don't you think? Yes, yeah. I, I think he is actually. He's yeah. quite, a, uh, he's quite a stoic type character, isn't mm, he? Well done to Belt and braces, Brit. Yeah. Oh, he is very much. Well done to Captain Tom as well. I was uh, Colonel uh, Tom. He's uh, been c- upgraded. Colonel, Colonel. He's been Colonel now, isn't he? Yeah. I was, I was really moved the other day watching the uh, the Spitfire and the Hurricane fly past. Did yeah. you see that? Did you see that? I watched that. I looked at the BBC News article about it, and, and actually, I, I welled up. I have to say, yeah. um, uh, the thing that hit me the most was the birthday cards. Mm. And did you see that? The, so all of the birthday cards he's received, something like twenty five thousand, <laughs> uh, all in his in the school, yeah. uh, which happens to be the school his grandson go, or his great grandson oh, goes lovely. to. Yeah. Uh, so they've taken the whole of the hall up. And they, they, and this amazing picture of these twenty five thousand birthday cards, and they, and they all stood up. They're all, they're not just laying on the floor. They're all stood up. And I was like, oh, you know, I'd love to just go in there with a big puffy blow and go. <laughs> no, no, Kev, no. <laughs> Do you know, you must. He, he, I, I look, I look at him when uh, when he's answering questions from these interviewers, etc. He must be sat there thinking, I only want, I only wanted to walk around the garden a few times. I know what all the fuss is about. <laughs> I know, bless him. Uh, Brilliant. Well, we'll be back tomorrow. Um, Have a nice Sunday and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye, bye, bye. The Fuji Cast is an independent Loading Zone production. Goodbye, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. We're back tomorrow with another show. Well, unless we're fired, we'll talk to you then. Goodbye, sweetheart. Goodbye. Goodbye.